Welcome to the People, Passion, and Purpose podcast, where you will hear from creative small business owners in the trenches every single day, talking story, talking lessons, talking failures, talking truth. I'm your host, Nina L. Kovner. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome today's guest, Gordon Miller, CEO of Hairbrain and my bestie. Gordon, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I am so excited, Nina. It's, um, you've been my guest three times. It's about time. <laughs> it's about time. And you know, it's crazy because when I, when I put this podcast plan together, I'm like, I'm going to have these extended episodes every now and again, where people like yourself are going to join me. So this is our first, you are our first extended episode. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. So let's dive right in because you, I know you and I, we could go on for hours, which we would not put our listeners through that pain. So um, how did you end up here today? Like, what's your story? Oh, <laughs> well, we won't put your listeners through that pain. <laughs> let's go back <laughs> to what you just said. <laughs> it's such a long 40 year journey, but the, the really tr- truncated version is, um, well, first and foremost, I'm not a hairdresser. I've never been a salon owner. And, um, but I came into the industry following a four, kind of a traditional four-year college degree program. And long story, but accidentally fell into beauty working at a, a, a chain of cosmetology schools in, in Denver, Colorado, and, and chain of salons as well. And um, that, uh, oh, so many stories there, but that led me to a, a to, to, Pivot Point in Chicago. Um, Leo Passage, my mentor and dear friend, um, brought me to Chicago and was with him for 10 years and then Milady Publishing and then 10 years at the National Cosmetology Association. And then a lot. Of, and then we, you and I together dove into social and digital and lost our minds in the best way possible. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that led me to American Salon, where I was publisher for a good while. And now I'm so excited to be exactly where I'm supposed to be at this point in my career, which is uh, in the role of CEO at Hairbrained, um, an, an amazing uh, digital and social community that also comes together in amazing ways in real time. And um, life is fabulous. I love that. And, you know, Gordon, y- you definitely are the the biggest brain and the smartest person I know in the professional beauty space. And, and I know that so many people look up to you and, and you've given so many people so much guidance. And I love I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy for the harebrained community um, to be able to have that wealth of wisdom and knowledge uh, to tap into with you every single day. So let me ask you, because th- th- you did have so many cool um, companies that you worked with that, you know, started that, that beauty school and, and all of that. Is there is there one job you loved the most? Like, is there one that oh. you'll always say? Because mine is I loved being a shampoo girl. And I mean, I loved all my jobs, but being a shampoo, I, we called my we called my title shampoo chick but it just will forever be a highlight of my career is there any one job um that was a highlight yeah well i mean so many like you like you you know it, it becomes hard to pick but there is there is that one standout i was like if i had to if i could pick that one moment and just if it was groundhog day you know be like where would i like to be stuck you know in groundhog day um, it, it would be, you know, I spent about a year and a half rather unexpectedly as director of the pivot point school in Chicago. And I had come in for other reasons, but I just, uh, some stuff was going on and I just kind of fell into it. The schools were expanding and Robert Passage was the director of the school and he moved out to open another big school in the suburbs of Chicago. And, and Leo and Robert together asked me if I'd step in and, and assume that role for a bit. Um, while I was doing other things, um, I was Mr. Gordon. <laughs> I love it. That's what we're going to call you now. That I should be Mr. your Gordon. Instagram, Mr. Gordon. And, yeah, and it was, um, and, and at that time, it was, um, um, that school's no longer open, but um, it was a um, an inner city school with an extremely diverse population, um, um, and, and a lot of the student population was, was, um, was, was, really looking to, to do, you know, big things with their lives and, and came from a lot of challenges. And, you know, there was close to 500 students in that school and it was a time of change. Um, it was probably like around, I don't know, like 1990, maybe late eighties. And, um, I had 
a blast. I, I love students and I love being with people who are learning at any stage in their career, but young people who were really on fire, it was such a great, great group of students. And, um, and it was a challenging time. And I just, I, I was, I just loved every moment of it. Oh, I love that. And I mean, I, I totally, I, I could totally see that because you are truly, you know, like I said, you're an educator, you're an advisor, you're an advice giver. It's in, it's in your DNA. And I could see how uh, how much the, the students, uh, what a gift for them and for you, obviously, as you share. But what an incredible yeah. experience. So let's talk about this podcast is all about small business ownership and and leadership and stuff like that. And and I know that. Uh, of course, you've worked with salon owners um, and salon people your entire career. And I also know you're a big fan of the book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yes. So can you kind of give us some context around that? What is it about the E-Myth that you believe is so important and relevant when it comes to small business ownership, salon ownership? Give us a little a little uh, bit about that. Well, you know, the funny thing about the E-Myth, which I recommend to anybody who's even considering going into small business, is it's a must read. And if you're already there, I think it's still a must read. Um, when I first discovered the E-Myth, people were buzzing about it, and um, which is quite a long time ago now. The um, I thought because of the timing that E was about the online thing, you know, e-learning, ah. you know, e- e- e-commerce. I really did. I actually picked it up, bought it for that reason. But actually the E is for entrepreneurship, you know, and being an entrepreneur. So it's the myth of entrepre- entrepreneurialism. Um, and and the, the premise of the book is that, um, that it's, it's, it's very, very common in small businesses for the people who, who do something that a business is known to do, in our situation, it would be hairdressing. Uh, in the opening of the book, um, he talks about baking pies. And, um, and the idea that someone who kind of toils away at that, who's very successful at the doing, the doing of hair, the baking of pies, someday will probably have the itch to become that small business owner. And they feel that we naturally feel it's a, it's a progression, a, a natural progression in our in our careers, in our lives. And then he he points out really kind of the, the, the dichotomy, you know, between being successful at doing something versus running the business that sells that something and how they're very, very different skill sets and, and, and how it can be a trap to get caught in that mindset that's a natural progression of my career because I've done well at doing something is to then own that business. And how many lives are are literally destroyed by taking that wrong turn, you know, professionally. And so then he sets out all of the the learnings that we we need to have if we're going to open a small business. What what does it take? Um, And what should you be focused on um, as you consider whether or not it's the right path, you know, and I always talk about, you know, it's like like w- for a hairdresser deciding uh, a new color technique comes along or the men's grooming thing explodes. And, you know, should I who've been successful behind the chair, you know, cutting and styling, jump into men's grooming necessarily? Is it the right fit for me? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Same in ownership. So, um, yeah, what a great book. I love that. And I just realized as we were talking that I don't have that on my recommended reading list for my clients. And that is um, a big fail on my part. So for any A schoolers or social school members or any clients that I ever are listening, go grab the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Of all the years you have been in the pro beauty space, what are some of these common challenges that you see with ownership? I know your, you yourself are a client of a salon. Uh, you, you, you've you been a client of a salon. You've obviously worked with salons on very different um, uh, areas of, of the business. And so you've got some really good context and wisdom. What are some of these common challenges that you're seeing, that you've seen? I think, well, and you and I, you know, but I think what fascinates me the most about the answer to this question is having done this now for 40 years and, and not, not being a hairdresser, not being a salon owner. I don't know. I, I think I have a unique ability to kind of stand kind of outside of it all from mm-hmm. time to time and just mm-hmm. kind of look at it from a different perspective, whether it's the client perspective or, or just as kind of a business person who has a different context perspective. Cause I like to look at all the parts and pieces, big picture, and then kind of get down into the weeds with people. 
And so, you know, I, I think one of the, the most common things that we see is confusion around the job description of salon owner versus the job description you had you you had before you were a salon owner and making some <laughs> decisions about that transition because almost every salon owner I know was first and foremost a stylist or a colorist or you know somebody working behind the chair. And unlike my career and your career, I think in the business world, whereas we have been promoted or as we have morphed into other roles, um, unlike those circumstances where we've let go of a lot of what we did in that last role, mm -hmm. whether it's day to day responsibility or day to day focus, you know, sometimes very radical change, even though all that experience were building blocks, but we still had to let go of a lot of what we were doing so that we could tackle all that was needed to be done to be successful in our new roles. And I see a huge challenge in this industry and in, in making that determination of what is that new job? What does it really look like um, in terms of the day to day that I have to do to become successful? And what do I have to let go of? What am I willing to let go of? And if I'm not willing to let go of all that I have to let go of, ideally, then maybe I shouldn't accept that new job. Oh, it, it's it's so incredibly true. And you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's particularly if you're an employer, if you, of course, mostly salon people are listening to this. If you are an employment based salon and and you're trying to grow as a leader, uh, one of the most important parts of leadership is being present and paying attention because the team wants attention and, and, and you cannot pay attention and lead if you are actually doing hair. And, you know, I know that the, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, you don't understand. I'm the primary revenue earner and I need to make money. I get it. You get it. We see it. We've seen it for years, for decades. <laughs> Here we are back to the decades. We've seen it for decades, but there has to be a plan or there has to be a delegation or there has to be a manager, you know, built into that business model or whatever. Exactly. But the leader still has to lead and, and you can't do two things at the same time. And so I, I'm so I'm so glad that that you brought that up and it is so incredibly difficult to do but uh yeah but you just you brought up i up? think one of the key points that gets lost you know which is you know hire a manager you know I, I, again i think it comes down to job descriptions and it's like if you i don't know it's almost like if you had two pieces of paper right my my former job my stylist job my owner job Forget about me as a human being, but what should the owner do? What should I as a stylist do? And then, you know, you kind of do the little checkoffs. Well, I've, I've got to continue to do this other job. So therefore, I can't be a completely present owner in terms of the day-to-day -day ideal in terms of my responsibilities. And if there's enough bullet points that are missing, it's like, well, I better hire someone or delegate someone. I mean, there's a process you can go through sure. and actually do it. You know, because often it gets thought about, but it's that, you know, just do it thing that where people get stuck. Right. Exactly. So let me ask you something. Speaking of, of owners, let's say let's just say like the dream scenario is you have every single salon owner that's currently in business today, all in one room. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give them? Oh, my gosh. What would you share with them? Like, what would you want to say to them? Ooh, my brain is going so many directions. Okay, so I'll be maybe a little controversial first because, you know, I like to do that sometimes. I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, part of me would want to say and, and, and do the little, like, nobody be offended by this, you know, but part of me would want to say that, you know, everybody's here, every last one of you. How exciting is this? I have to start by saying you all shouldn't be here. Mm. And that's a, and, and a profound statement. And it could be, I think, you know, uh, not necessarily negative. I mean, I, I think I would encourage everybody to take a really big step back when they leave that day and, and say, go look really hard at what you're doing. And, and are you where you want to be? Do you have the wherewithal to get there? Or should you be reconsidering your direction? Um, we know, those of us who look at the big picture, 
that the rate of failure in this industry is extremely high on the ownership side, and we know that the profit margins are really, really thin. I've met so many salon owners over the years who live their lives in pain. Yes. Um, and, and I don't believe that they necessarily have to, but they feel stuck. And I think sometimes to just have that self-awareness that perhaps I, went, I took a left turn and I shouldn't have, or perhaps I took a left turn and I am somewhere that's not necessarily where I'm supposed to be or where, or, or it's not necessarily the path that's going to bring me to where I ideally would like to be with my life. And it's okay. And not only okay, I, I would hope that we feel it's necessary to shift gears and, and figure that out. So I think, you know, on the, I, I think I would really want to say to people, get some really deep self-awareness and decide, is this for you? Because I, I believe there's a very large percentage of people running salons today that it's not for them. And I think if they thought hard about it, they would figure that out. And the reason I want to say that is that I think there's a lot of dysfunction economically in our industry. And it comes by way of the fact that there's too many salons. And I, I you know, I just think like much of America, and I would say we are you and I've talked about this many times, you know, I, I believe we are always a reflection of the larger um, country, the larger economy, um, the larger community that we're living in. And, and today, more than ever, there's a little bit too much of everything, perhaps. Um, in my neighborhood, there's too many dry cleaners. There's too many coffee shops. There's too many fast food joints. And when, I, when I say too many, I mean just based on the number of people who live in my neighborhood. And I walk by and I see these little businesses, some of them in despair. And I think a lot of that despair is just there aren't enough customers in a given geographical region. And so, so I, you know, I, I, I think um, it's important to, you know, be self-aware enough to know, you know, how you fit into that. And do, again, do you have the wherewithal? On the other side, you know, I, I'd want to also say to people how much opportunity there is in this industry how fortunate they they are to have those opportunities in front of them. Again, it goes back to they have the wherewithal, you know, to be a leader, you know, to be an entrepreneur, not easy, not easy um, roles to play, you know, to, to be an HR manager, you know, you want to get into the weeds, to be a great marketer, you know, these all are skills that fortunately, thanks to people like you, you know, they can acquire, you know, they can learn. Um, but, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, again, that self-awareness and are, are, are they up to the task? And if they are, yay, because again, there's so many great opportunities. You're, you're so right. And I'm so glad, I'm so glad you brought that up because it is stuff that's not talked about as often maybe as it needs to be. But I can't tell you how many times people have come to me and said, I want to open a salon and there's this 3000 square foot space and I want to have 12 stations and I'm all, whoa. Yeah. And because there is so much about expectation or lack of expectation or lack of self-awareness and the expectation that salons typically are a way to make money. We know that that's, you know, again, it's very slim profit margins. And as you know, the whole retail game shifts to the online space, that's changing the model even more. And again, I'm speaking, of course, of more employment based salons, but, um, you know, it, it's it's tricky. And, you know, there the, I see that. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that because of that lack of a, a, a both awareness and self-awareness, budgeting doesn't even come into play. You know, forecasting's not coming into play. Um, again, profit expectations, you know, the accountant side of things and understanding basic P&Ls. And, and, and then again, back to the most important thing, leadership and culture, uh, because it's not easy to be a leader. And typically what we've seen is that kind of back to that e-myth, I do hair. I know I can do it better than the current owners doing it. So I'm going to open a salon. And that's like, you just skipped 5,000 steps in between that, you know? Well, can I add there? Well, two things I have to say. One is, and you've heard me say this so many times when we do panels together, it's like that whole I do hair well thing is like, to me, like the, the worst reason of all to do, to open a business, to it's, there's such, I think, uh, I think the industry gets very confused sometimes about this topic. And, and what I mean by that is like, okay, I do hair well, therefore I will be successful, which to me says, well, that means that the consuming public will recognize that I'm better than most and therefore I will do well. Exactly. And I, and I always say as a consumer and as someone who talks to consumers, we consumers suck at recognizing good hair. 
We <laughs> recognize good experiences. We recognize, you know, when the brand stuff is happening, you know, all in the right way, when the customer service and the communications. But, you know, a good haircut from a great haircut, that's not. So if that's your reason, I say, you know, take a big step backwards. The other thing I have to say, going back to that, you mentioned that empty 3,500 square foot salon, right? It's like, ooh, it's an opportunity. I, I, my advice to everybody is take a big step back and say, why is that building empty? What happened? What really happened? And is the fact that you're a better hairdresser the reason you really think you'll succeed where someone else failed? And often failure is a lot more complicated than we think. Whatever we thought we knew, we should really take a big step back and spend some more time pondering what that failure was about before we jump in and put our life savings against it or give up a great job. I love that. And and you were saying we, we you know, as consumers, we can't tell a good haircut from a great haircut. That goes back to Simon Sinek, start with why, mm-hmm. you know, and it's what we talked about on, on the Hairbrain, you know, podcast last week is, is that, you know, if you believe, which I believe, and I've subscribed to this philosophy for as long as I've been a marketer, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, then yeah, that completely explains why the I'm a great colorist doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, you know, it's it, it's interesting. You were talking about failure. And uh, I, I, I've heard a lot lately, lately, um, some new salon owners that are struggling, which it's always a struggle in the beginning, but it's more of the overwhelm, the anxiety, the, the pain, as you mentioned earlier. Why didn't anyone tell me it was going to be this hard? I wish I would have known Nobody ever, why doesn't anybody, what, and it's like, those are those moments that I have to take a a big step back and a big deep breath and say, are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) To me, it's like, well, you know, why didn't somebody tell me that it's um, hard to balayage? Um, Again, if you think about the technical and what hairdressers go through to achieve greatness, um, I think most people know the path. They take the classes, they get the insights, they get the mentorships, they do the apprenticeships. They, they, you know, people tell them, oh, this is hard. Scissor over coma is hard. Here's how you go about being successful at it. So few take that same deep dive into learning how to be good business people. Because if they had someone, they would have heard of course. In those many classes. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> so it's, I know. it's hard. And I think, you know, the other side of it, which, you know, we're, we're all human is that, you know, the information's there. We just don't want to listen. Right. Yeah. Like we just, and, and I think that's that going back to that self-awareness, you, we all need to own the fact that the information was out there. We just chose not to listen to it, you know, and, and we had to do it our way. And, and I get it because that again is very much that entrepreneurial spirit, like against all odds, you know, high risk, all of that. But again, going back to that pain that you mentioned, and and I, I deal with that every day, that pain and, and it does hurt and it does make me sad. And, um, and, and again, why I do what I do, you know, every day is to try to build some of that awareness to say, guys, this is really important and this is really hard. This is Can I this can is I hard. share my biggest pet peeve around all this? Yes. That's <laughs> my biggest. <laughs> I don't know why it flew into my mind. Um, for those who are who are considering or going into ownership or or, or new owners. Um, and that is uh, maybe I'll use parenthood as an analogy. I've, I've met many friends who, you know, raising new children, you know, their own children saying, I'm not going to be my mother. My mother did this, that or the other. We all love our mothers, but yes. you know, nobody's perfect. Love you, mom. Uh, yeah. Hey, mom, I'm, I'm not going to be that, you know. And then five years later, I was like, oh, crap, I'm that. And so many people I know who go into ownership, you know, when you talk about why are they doing this? Well, the, where I worked, they didn't create an environment um, that was proactive. They didn't create a culture. There was no leadership. Um, they didn't pat me on the back when I deserved it. They didn't counsel me, coach me, you know, go down the list, long list. They didn't give me opportunity. They didn't pay me. Right. They weren't transparent, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then I see so many salon owners and, you know, that I meet five, 10 years later when I listen to the complaint lists about their lives as owners, I can't help, but sometimes say, let's talk about when you were a stylist. 
were you were <laughs> what what were you saying about the owner um whether it is that I, my favorite is is um oh my god um I trained him so hard and, 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 and we worked so hard, well as a team and we did this. Now I have a stylist leaving. How dare they? And my favorite thing to say to those owners is, did you ever work for somebody? Did you ever leave somebody? Did you, do you understand what that feels like or what that did feel like for you? And can you maybe apply some of that same thinking to the person who's leaving you? Right. Um, anyway. Yeah. It's, it's so tough. You know, there, there's so much emotion, um, you know, in this, in, in, with creative folks, you know, with creative entrepreneurs and highly charged, a lot of emotion and, you know, an area that I, I focus on a lot, which, you know, is the, the, the personal empowerment and development side of things, because I was just sharing this. I, I don't know. I think it was on a, it was on an Instagram live, I think the other day. And, um, I got a question about, you know, the, the same questions about some of the team members are being assholes or, you know, someone's whatever, mean girl culture, this or the other. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I was explaining that, you know, in 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 psychology, when if you work with a therapist, which I recommend everybody work with some sort of mental health professional, um, when when we have our early childhood traumas or, you know, events and situations that have a dramatic, traumatic impact on us, that begins to stunt our emotional development. Mm -hmm. And so when I was, uh, when I put myself in treatment in 2007, I was 12 years old emotionally and I was 41 years old. Um, what's that chronologically or whatever, uh -huh. you know? And so it, it, if you, if we look at that and we look at, um, you're not dealing with a bunch of adults. We're dealing with, um, a, 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 a typically, and again, in creative fields, emotionally, um, uh, developmentally not developed, you know, emotionally underdeveloped. Um, and, and so that's where so much of that drama and that, that fear of courageous conversations and, and, uh, lack of boundary setting and, and all of those things happen. And, um, and, and, and so, like you said, you know, you become your mother. Well, well, if you were in that environment, you were part of that environment. And then you go on to say, I'm going to be a different kind of leader. I'm going to be a better leader. I'm not going to do what my leader did yet. You're still emotionally underdeveloped. You are going to do exactly what you are going to recreate that exact scenario, not with intention, with completely subconsciously. Uh, and so, you know, I, I just I've never understood why um, personal development. I don't mean personal development like rah, rah, you can do it. Self-confident shit. I'm talking about really doing that inside work and doing that trauma healing work. Um in in creative professions like like the beauty industry, because so many of the troubles that we have are based on our um, childhood trauma and all whatever we're going through, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, panics or whatever it is, addiction. So, you know, that's one of the reasons that I, you know, have do what I do at Passion Squared. And, and I know that you've seen this. You've seen this forever, you know, since day one from beauty school, you know, working in the beauty schools on and, and, and I, I really, I, I think it's so important what you said about that. We are, we do become our mothers, so to speak. And it's so that awareness about that is so important. Well, let me add a whole nother dynamic to layer on top of that. I think that just adds to the complexity of, of everything we're talking about here. I learned this very well on the education side of the industry. And I know, you know, this well from your history in education, we are an industry, you know, that skews very high, you know, on on the um, the scale of dyslexia, of of learning disabilities, of attention deficit disorder before we ever even knew what it was. You know, this highly highly creative and, and emotional, um, you know, aspect of the people who are drawn to this industry, and then add on top of that a, another thing, um, which is the trauma sometimes that's associated with that. Um, 
before we get to the industry, um, those challenges that we have in high school and junior high school and, and all the, the baggage that can come with that when you no one recognized that you had difficulty learning a traditional way. And yet you might have been a genius. You might be a genius, you know, um, from a non-traditional learning perspective. Sure. And so, Add that in to working, you know, managing a team of people who not only have what you're referencing, but all this other stuff. It's not easy, you know, to be a leader, um, period. But when you, you're dealing with all the things that we're talking about here and add in those, you know, educational um, issues, you know, that you've got to tr train people a different way. Because, you know, if you're if someone's trying to grow their career and they're trying to learn new things, but the person teaching them isn't teaching them in a way that connects to them as a learner, then that's another wasted opportunity and becomes another block in that person's professional development. So very true. I, I was having a discussion um, with a friend about um, employment handbooks <clears throat> the other day. Um, you know, I, 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 I think about, again, just over the years, um, and this really speaks to kind of marketing and communications and what you're talking about, education, retention, those types of things, uh, understanding who you're talking to. And you can open up a, a, a manual for any company, you know, any, any business where we're talking specifically about salons, and it's all just a bunch of words. It's all just paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. And it's like, okay, so let's think about this for a minute. Is this, is this engaging? Is this, is this, how do, I mean, nobody reads anyways, but it's something as simple as that. Well, I wrote it all down and well, you know, it, okay, but that's not how certain creative folks learn, right? Exactly. Um, you know, I, I worked a lot in my, in my previous career with a philosophy called multiple intelligences as, as you're familiar with. And <clears throat> Uh, what we found is that, you know, we've got, you know, several different intelligences in the way that we learn. And uh, in 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 the hairdressing world, of course, um, body kinesthetic is, is 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 very dominant. And that's that hands on. That's that learning by doing, you know, physically, you know, doing something. And that's why, of course, hands on education can be so effective. Um, and beauty school, you know, beauty school practices and people practicing on mannequins or whatever, you know, hands on, hands on, hands on and um, interpersonal learning by interacting and connecting. Well, if you think of a typical meeting, team meeting, there's not much body kinesthetic and really not a lot of interpersonal either, because usually it's, you know, who didn't wash the color bowls? And, you know, it's like, yeah, no, that's not really the way to inspire me to want to like do something and certainly not helping me, you know, it, to do whatever. So, again, it. it it, it is. There's so many parts to this, you know, and and, and it kind of goes back to really understanding that. Um, and it may not be before you decide to open, but at some point in your ownership journey, you know, it, it's, it's all stuff you need to look at. It's particularly if you're unhappy. And like you said, you know, in pain, um, it the dyslexia thing, I spelt my name A-N-I-N. Up until probably mid elementary school. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, dyslexia has definitely been a big part of my story. Um, and we can still be awesome, right? We can still create, we can still be successful, but it, it definitely takes, takes a lot of work and a different approach. You know, and I think that, you know, the things that we learn, and, and I think, you know, mentioning a staff meeting is a great, great, you know, um, example, because it's, it's, it's like the, for so many, it's like the downer moment of their day. It's like, Oh, I got a staff. Meeting. Right. It should and be it, the most awesome part of the day. Right. And, they, and stuff gets thrown at us. And then yeah. a month later, the owner's frustrated because something didn't happen. It's like, I, I told them all in the staff. Meeting. I know. You know but, but to your point, you know, it's like perhaps they didn't learn. And I, and I think, you know, there's this educational component of leadership that's so important and so powerful. And sometimes it just happens naturally and, and, and more often than not, it doesn't. But I think the recognition that, you know, what we learn, you know, really, truly learn the things that we're educated on that sink into our brains and into our personas and into our, our, our lives. Um, that's like the prism of everything that that happens in life. And so to not 
get as an owner, you know, how important that is. In a classroom, we, we know to check in with students, right? We know that there's a loop to learning, that teaching is one thing, learning is another. And both have to happen. You know, you have to have you have to know what the outcome is. Ooh, that person learned. Yay. You know, if something's really important in a salon, you know, I think it's really critical that owner finds a way to confirm that learning actually happened, even if it's not a class. And and I think again that recognition that all that stuff that we take in that sticks with us as human beings, it really is a, a giant prism that um, affects how we look at life, including whether we show up on time or not, you know, depending on how we learned about how important or not important that is. Right. And what we value and understanding what we value. Leadership is tough. And, and, and I, you know, a, that's why I'm in constant awe and constantly inspired by by the leadership um, that I have the opportunity to work with every day in the professional beauty space because it is not easy. And, um, and, and I, you know, it, of course, made me think again of Simon Sinek, um, Leaders Eat Last, which is another great book of his. But, you know, it really kind of goes back to that DNA of a leader. I think really sits in that servant's heart, you know, uh, approach and not everyone has that and that's okay. You know, not everybody. Um, and like you said, if you're behind the chair full time, well, then you can't serve, you can't teach, you can't ensure learnings happens. And what happens is resentment builds up. We all know this. It's happened to all of us. And then that's no fun because leadership can't really happen when we're holding a lot of resentment against mm -hmm. someone that didn't show up on time or somebody that, you know, whatever, said something mean or didn't do the pre-booking correctly or whatever, you know, whatever that thing is. And, and so it really goes back to, is that what you're passionate about, you know, it, it, growing people. That's your job is to is to nurture and care for and grow people. And the people in turn grow the business. That's how it works. And, you know, I, I think, again, something that always frustrates me about our business and, and sometimes scares me a little bit for so many people who are in it is that unlike so many other industries, you know, we we we've made it okay to not be a full-time owner, you know, or, um, or take on some of the responsibilities or just must do. So I always say, you know, it's like look outside of the industry for the best examples of how to be great inside of this industry. You know, look at, look at, because it's so easy to, to judge when you're looking at another salon, you know, look at a great restaurant, look at a great hotel, look at a great, you know, small business of some other kind. And typically you'll see that there's an owner being an owner, you know, and there's a manager being a manager and there is a there's a there's a cake baker baking cakes, you know, and I, I just think there's so many great lessons to be learned around us. And sometimes it's more fruitful to look outside than to to look, you know, up the street at the other salon. Right. And and the last thing I'll say on this, I have until we, move, we I need, need to move to the next question. But <clears throat> the last thing I'll say is it's OK. It's OK to bake the best, most awesome delightful cakes in the world. You don't have to own the cake shop. Mm -hmm. You know, you, yes. <laughs> there's so many yes. awesome, like you said, so many awesome opportunities and so many fulfilling careers and just, you know, it's endless. It really is. And, and what we can do, especially now with the online space and contributing our voice, becoming a storyteller, blogging, helping the homeless. You know, there's just I mean, it, the list goes on and on. There's so many ways to live your purpose and um, and follow your passion that doesn't necessarily have to include being a leader and owner. So. Speaking of passion and purpose, what does passion and purpose mean to you? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Let me ask you, what, what are you most passionate about? Um, excluding coffee and Cody. Coffee and Cody. No, we have to include them too. Which, are, which I have few, huge passions around, <laughs> anybody who may know me. Cody the dog, by the way. Cody is. Yeah, Cody's my baby. Um, he's Gordon's princess. And coffee is my drink of, of choice. Um, I've got one now in front of me. The... Um, Oh my gosh, my, my passion. 
so many, but I, I think if I blow it all down and, and it's why I'm doing what I am today. And, and, and that is the big idea of community. And in my day, every life, it's, you know, it's the community of hairdressers who've given me, you know, every good thing that I have in my life. And, um, and I, and I've learned a long time ago that by, by having passion for them and, and about what they do, um, which has just become something that naturally came to, into my life, but that by, you know, tapping into that, that, that the work I do only gets better and the life I have, um, similarly gets better. I get crazy joy from being with the people who, who are in this industry. You and I just spent, um, several days at, at ISSC Long Beach, um, with our community, um, and many sub communities, you know, but tens of thousands of hairdressers together. And I, you know, I went in with a cold and I, and I bumped into so many people who said, Oh my God, your energy is crazy, positive and crazy good. And inside I'm just kind of like, Oh, I don't feel all that great. But I'm glad I look, I'm glad I looked that way. And it wasn't fake. Whatever they saw was just me bubbling out. Right. Right. And it's because, <laughs> you know, because again, I have this passion and I love the conversations about the business, about the work. I love learning what everybody's up to. I love because I come home and think about the trends, you know, I try to put all the pieces together. So it's a much bigger puzzle that I'm always working on. And then hopefully um, from all those experiences and interactions and insights, I come away with some things that help us in my work at Hairbrained or the previous work I've done in just making what we do every day, day better to serve that community. I love that. And I will just make a note because everyone knows I'm such a germaphobe. Gordon came to the show with a cold um, the end of a cold and he was not contagious. Okay. I was not contagious. My doctor told me I was good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. You're, you are obsessive about quotes. I'm obsessive about quotes. So I have to ask you, what's your favorite quote or one of your favorites? I know you don't have one. Oh man, there's so many, there's so many, so many, so many. Um, I'm going to say two and I might get the first one a little bit wrong. Um, but, but the, First one is Nelson Mandela has a great quote, you know, about education, education being the most powerful weapon um, to change the world. And um, again, I spent most of my career on the education side of the industry and always one way or another connected to it. I mean, you know, Hairbrain's a community. We're not an educational company per se, um, but we are steeped very deeply in education and, and 80 plus percent of our members self-identify as educators. I mean, I learned early on in life, um, thanks to my my folks, um, the power of education to absolutely transform us individually as communities, as 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 professions. It's, it's insane how education, just one little learning can just like flip your life in a great direction. So that's number one. And the other, I think, um, that's been with me for a long time is, um, is Mahatma Gandhi's, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. And, um, you know, it's all about, you know, just modeling that change. You know, if you want the world to be a kinder place, be more kind, you know, um, if you want the industry to be more business savvy, then, you know, be more business savvy and be more connected and, and have a deeper understanding. So those are my favorites. I love that. And, you know, I, I'm going to add one more quote, which reminds me of you. I know that it, it it is also one of your favorites. And I just think it's so appropriate. Um it's the Margaret Mead quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Oh, I, I so love that. And, you know, there's there's so many moments throughout the course of my career and then and, and the bigger course of my life, especially in the times we're living in today, that I have shared that one. I haven't shared it in a while. I may have to post it tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> um, because I just, I believe in it, you know, so very deeply. And I think, again, you know, one of the reasons I love being in this industry is, you know, it's an industry filled with compassionate people, with empathetic people, but with, with really with change makers. I mean, I, you know, how much, how much does this community of professionals give back to the world? You know, whether it's, you know, through the cut it out program and supporting people with domestic violence or doing the cancer walks or raising, you know, raising funds to help people in Africa. I mean, it's just, it goes on and on and on. And, um, this, you know, we're so fortunate to work with these small groups of people who do amazing things for the world. I agree. What a blessing. What a blessing it is. Gordon. Thank you so much. Are we out of time? I, we, I, it's double. It's over double can the I, normal can I episode. Say, but can I, I, 
Yes, you can say anything you want. And also, uh, please tell us where we find you. Tell us where to find Hairbrain. What do we do? All that info. The first place where you can find Gordon and Nina, you can, when this podcast, when you're done with this podcast, go over to the Hairbrain Conversations podcast yes. and listen to Gordon and Nina. <laughs> <laughs> we just did a podcast together. And, like you're not uh, sick of us so already. Much fun. <laughs> A completely different conversation. Yes, so very want, different conversation. If you want more of us, go over, go over there. <laughs> uh, you can you can find me, of course, on Hairbrain, hairbrain.me, um, not .com, .me. Um, and that is the Hairbrain community where, where um, I spend a good bulk of my life. You can um, follow Hairbrain at, uh, on Instagram, hairbrain underscore official um, is our handle over on Instagram and just hairbrain over on Facebook. And then me personally, uh, slash professionally, you can find me on Instagram at Gordon M. And that's with one O. So it's G-O-R-D-N-M uh, over on Instagram, where I love to share quotes and coffee and a little bit of Cody. Yes, I love it. Well, thank you, Gordon. You know, not just for obviously taking the time to to share um really important information that that we need to keep talking about, but also for being such a beacon of light in this industry for for being so committed and so passionate and helping so many people over the last few decades. Um, and, you know, to me, most importantly, for being um, a, a good friend to the industry and of course an incredible awesome friend to me thank you so much for joining us i love you all that back to you and i i, I know we're at the end so i won't go on with my three minutes of kudos to nina because if it's, it's anybody who's heard me talk go over to go over to hairbreak conversations <laughs> to hear me go on and on about you and all the great things you've done and thank oh. you so much for being my absolute bestie <laughs> i adore you and I, I i welcome this opportunity to share with your audience thank you thanks gordon thanks for listening everyone Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. To learn more about Passion Squared, you can visit us at passionsquared.net. You can find us on the gram and on Facebook at Passion Squared. And be sure to subscribe and share with your friends. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for joining us. Have an awesome day, guys. Love you.